you know, I've been thinking. Oh, yes. And what have you been thinking? Well, I've been thinking that it's thinking that got us where we are today. Hmm? Well, I followed your first bit about you having been thinking again, but I got lost on the second bit of thinking. Well, well, just look at our village today. Yeah, so I'm looking. What can you see? Hmm, well... Uh, I can see a group of people who aren't exactly living off the fat of the land, but they are doing very nicely, thank you. Right. And how did this happen when, not all that long ago, we lived in a subsistence economy? Oh, now I see what you mean. You mean which pieces of thinking, which ideas, took us from one level of prosperity to another? Right. Why? Hmm. It's quite simple, really. Subsistence is the economy we started out with, and a surplus is what we've got now. Yes. And the way we got from one to the other was by specialisation and by mechanisation. Sometimes a bit of one, sometimes a bit of the other, and sometimes a bit of both. Do you remember what it was like, living in a subsistence economy? Oh, could I ever forget. We used to spend all our time and energy just getting ourselves enough food to stay alive. And there was never anything left over. And then we discovered division of labour by product. Oh, yes, what a day that was. <laughs> it certainly was. We divided labour by product, which just meant that instead of every family doing everything for itself, one family specialised in sheep, one in cattle... Another specialised in fish. Another in tailoring and cloth making. Oh, that was us. Yes, and as a result, eight families produced enough to feed ten, which left two families with nothing to do. So they built the bridge, which took our cattle across to new pastures. And then they had time to dig the irrigation channel, which took the water to more of our crops. Do you remember what happened then? Yes. Then came division of labour by process. Until then, to make anything, one person had always done everything. I used to do everything from shearing the sheep to weaving the cloth, one process after another. It was slow, and I wasn't very good at all of it. So, we decided to specialise in one process each. Hmm. One did all the shearing. Another the washing. Yeah, another the spinning. And another did the dyeing. Another the weaving. Another for finishing. And the result was that the same amount of people produced twice as many shawls by working together, one process each, as they would have done making complete shawls by themselves. And, what's more, the shawls were much better made. Oh, thank you very much. Anyway, that's how we left our subsistence economy behind, to produce our surplus. It was our first great idea. We specialised. We specialised by product and we specialised by process. And our second great idea was... We mechanised. We had ideas for new devices and we had ideas to harness horses and oxen. In our family's case, our greatest idea for mechanisation and our most useful device was the wheel. Oh, yeah, you can say that again. The wheel meant that the children could bring home in one go what would previously have taken you and me six journeys. Do you remember that day when you thought of saving your own strength by letting the animals do the work for you? <laughs> oh, yes. What a great day that was. Yeah. Animal muscle power. But it was nothing compared to what's happened since we discovered how to harness the forces of nature. Yeah. There was the energy of wind. And the energy of water. And eventually, there was the energy of coal. And the energy of oil. And linking these sources of energy to our mechanical devices meant that we could till soil, draw water, grind corn and produce all kinds of things far more quickly than simply by using our own muscles. Mechanisation was the second step out of the subsistence economy. We mechanised by inventing devices and by using natural forces to add to our own efforts. And it was specialisation and mechanisation that gave us our surplus. But what is the surplus? What is it that specialisation and mechanisation gave us? First, we now have stores of food that'll last us through the winter. We have a few luxuries to tide us over until the harvest. Second, 
We have surplus food and manufactured goods that we can exchange for other things we want when the trader brings them. Third, we built a bridge and a barn and a water wheel. We dug irrigation channels. We've made spinning wheels and ploughs and they help us protect or even increase our prosperity. Fourth, we can spare one or two people from the fields to serve the rest. Part of the surplus food can go to somebody who teaches the children and somebody who looks after the sick. And fifth, we have a bit of time to spare. We can play games occasionally, yeah, just, paint just... beautiful pictures on our crockery or make beautiful clay figures. Hmm. Or decorate our huts. So we applied our surplus to five different things. Reserves, in this case food. Trade. Capital. Services. And leisure. All this may not seem much if you don't remember how they started out in a subsistence economy. I'll never forget it. Days of cold, sickness, hunger, days of backbreaking toil. It all seems a long way away now. Yes, we have come a long way. Yeah. Of course, I don't really have to tell you that our community is imaginary. A valley like ours never really existed. Not exactly, anyway, but everything we've seen, everything we've talked about, really happened through the ages, in some community or another. Let's take a look at reality for a minute. This is how men once tried to set down their own reality. These are the actual pictures drawn by primitive men, showing their own lives as hunters and wanderers. And for all but a few thousand of his one or two million years on this planet, this is how man really lived. Hand to mouth, day to day, and place to place. He followed the herds, eating any wild animals he could kill, gathering whatever wild fruit and vegetables he could manage to find. But for most people, life began to change dramatically about 10,000 years ago, when human beings found the secret of staying in one place. The secret was farming, domesticating animals, pigs and cattle, sheep and goats, and cultivating crops. By finding that secret, man had stumbled on the path to prosperity. The first prosperous civilizations grew up in four great river valleys. The Yellow River in northeastern China, the Indus in Pakistan, the Tigris and Euphrates in modern Iraq and ancient Babylon, and the Nile in Egypt. And yet, if you look at those great fertile valleys today, you'll find a strange thing. They're now among the poorest of the world's nations, often unable to provide even enough food for their inhabitants. Until two or three hundred years ago, the richest countries were often the ones with the best land. But today, Great industrial communities have been built up in the world using resources imported from other places. In other words, some of their wealth comes from foreign trade. There'll always be a strong disagreement about why some countries have followed the path to prosperity and others haven't. But of one thing there is little doubt. Those who have achieved it have done so by creating a surplus. A big surplus, using exactly the same method as we did in our community. This factory, like all factories, is the result of division of labour by product. And the product is television sets. It produces them in a whole lot of different stages. Division of labour by process. It's mechanised and the production is achieved through devices like wheels, levers, gears, hinges and pulleys. Most of the energy comes from electricity, supplied by harnessing the resources of nature, like water, coal, oil and uranium. As a result, a thousand people working in a factory like this turn out half a million sets a year. Five hundred a year each. Since they don't need them all for themselves, they've created a massive surplus of television sets to exchange. So in effect, they'll be swapped for other people's surpluses. 
For his share of the exchange, a worker in a factory gets food, clothing, heating, a house and a car from other workers who produced more of those things than they needed. He also gets roads, street lighting, a teacher for his children, a doctor and a policeman as well. And after all that, he still has his evenings free to watch a television. Oh, of course, he still has his problems and frustrations. But when you consider the subsistence level where it all started long ago, is there any doubt about which sort of life you would prefer?